everybody. My name is Dawn Sardis. I'm one of the librarians at the Youth of Public Library. And uh, today, tonight we have with us Ebony J. Um, she is a licensed uh, accredited uh, social worker um, uh, and um, the uh, owner of, uh, of a local Euclid uh, social services agency called Enduring the Course. And um, she uh, is also an author of a book of that same title that uh, helps uh, parents uh, deal with um, the uh, modern issues and, uh, and challenges faced by parents today as they raise their children. Um, welcome, Ebony, and um, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. And, I'm excited. Uh, Euclid is actually my favorite um, library, so this is oh, a, what a this is an honor. Do. Yes, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just love it because you know, I wasn't born or raised in Ohio and I was so used to these drab old buildings and uh, and moldy books. And, and when I walked in this library, I was like, ah, <laughs> <laughs> when I first came for my interview, I was just I was just blown away by the Euclid Library. And, you know, I after 22 years, I walk in that library and I'm still blown away. So, yeah. Yeah, I've been going there for at least about 15 years. First off, Ebony, um, what is, in your agency, in your professional practice, what are some of the most common problems that you're seeing nowadays? Um, so overall, it is just the stressors of um, the pandemic and the aftermath. As uh, before you guys jumped on me and Ms. Don was kind of talking about the different um, challenges that we have or the things that we're looking forward to. And so that is one of the biggest things across the board um, is just the pandemic as a whole and how that's affecting everyone. Right. Have, um, have you noticed any, um, I, I was wondering, because I know my, um, I have a six-year-old grandson and I know that he was, before he got the, vac the vaccine was released, he was very anxious going out in public um, you know, he was always very um, insane about making sure his mask was up and on all the time. And he's sort of starting to relax a little now that he got that he was able to receive, you know, that vaccine when they lowered the age limit. So did you have, has there a lot of children been facing that kind of anxiety about catching the virus? You know, to be honest, um, I've, I've kind of seen the, maybe the opposite. They are, I see them tell the parents a lot more, where's your mask? We have to have our mask. Um, I haven't really seen a lot of it or either I see the other extreme where they're just um, very relaxed and they just don't care about a mask. But I haven't mm -hmm. seen a lot of kids be anxious. What I did see though, is I saw a lot of kids be anxious, especially in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, when the kids were home from school, but the parents had to continue to work, I saw a lot of kids be anxious for the, the safety of their parents, like what was going to happen to their parents more oh, than I the mask. It. Yeah, I think the kids more just get irritated with the mask or either they get used to the mask. Right. Well, that's that makes a lot of sense. I know my uh, my grandson also keep saying you forgot your mask to his mother and, and mm -hmm. me so it's uh, and his father so it's uh and as uh, you know so he's sort of like always reminding us and everything at that but he's, yeah <laughs> he's at, I don't know he seems to have a little bit of anxiety about him because we had a car accident a few years ago where I was rear-ended and he still remembers that to this day because he was in the back seat and he was he's always like now like Make sure nobody hits us. You know, every time we stop at the right. like, like, okay, I don't think it's going to happen right this minute. Okay. <laughs> so that's a that's a good thing to talk about too, as as we're talking about the book. So my book, it it is um something that is um it's kind of promoted to parents or it kind of speaks to parents. But if you actually read the book, it just talks about the mental health stigma and what to do, the direction to go and all of those type of things across the board. It can be applied across the board, um, but it does talk to parents. So even when you're describing that type of thing of the accident is um, that can be listed or treated as PTSD. And um, that's kind of important because a lot of people think when they hear PTSD, they relate it to the military. But the right. fact that the matter is PTSD can be anything that um, a person has experienced or they can, they ha we have 
uh, secondary PTSD, so they can have heard something um, that mm-hmm. caused them anxiousness, and it right. can, you know, it could be traumatic to them. So, um, one of the things in the Black community that um, I learned very, very early on is that the kids, um, or in the neighbor, in our neighborhoods, in our, you know, in our neighborhoods, there's a lot of crime, there's a lot of death, there's a lot of um, people being robbed, or houses breaking into, and cars and stuff like that, and so kids can, or or adults can be um, diagnosed with PTSD from even those type of things. Right, okay. On the flip side, the other, the other thing that happens to us too is that sometimes we get so desensitized to it, it's so normal to us that we right. don't realize how it affects us or how it affects our kids because this is, because this happens so often. And so when we're talking about um, my, my practice particularly, um, we like to talk about those type of things. So we like to talk about the stigma and and to let people know that that stuff is not normal. Like that's not okay. Like, yes, it happens regularly, but it's not normal. We're not supposed to be um, experienced that at such a high rate. Right. Yeah, it's, you know, the kids nowadays have a much, I think, much harder road to hoe than we did. I did, for instance, I did back when I was a kid. There was absolutely me too. You know, the the crime rates were much lower, I believe, and or else I, we just didn't hear about them as much. You mm-hmm. know, or, mm-hmm. or I have no idea. <laughs> yes, I mean, it's, not, it, it's it's a it's a lot of things. Of course, we have social media information gets to us sooner. We have um, people, you know, different things that different values different standards that that we had, you know, back in the day, we had different, where people, where neighborhoods and neighbors had the sense of, it was more a family, we took care of each other, we looked out for each other, you would tell on the neighborhood kids that they did something inappropriate, if you didn't discipline them, you know, yourself, because that's, that's what we had, and these type of, nowadays, you can't, you don't even know your neighbors, like, you don't even know who lives where, you may know their car, um, Uh but you don't even know you know, who right. your neighbors are anymore. And exactly. so that makes a huge difference. True. I've um, lived on my little street 22 years. I wouldn't know my neighbors if they came up and bit me on my nose. Um, but I remember when I was a kid, I was riding my bike. I fell and I got back on my bike and I was heading home because I was bleeding. And before I got home, my grandmother, because my grandmother lived with us, was there with band- with some with some peroxide and a bandage and says oh yes you know mrs watkins called me and told me she saw you fall right. out of her front window mm-hmm. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. great <laughs> you know I can't, yeah. so okay. we don't have those type of things a lot of times people um again as we're talking about some of the things we talk about in the book i talk a lot about reducing the stigma because people will say different things different patterns that we have been taught and one of the things is that people like to say like, oh, that's the result of babies having babies. And that's not actually true because, I mean, if you think about in Bible times, those women were kids themselves. Mm-hmm. I know that I'm a product of a teen mom. My mom had me at 14 and um, I think I'm pretty okay. <laughs> I think yeah, that I, I was you know, I turned out. I was actually and that's a what I'm mom too. So, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, my husband and I, we were dating starting when I was 14 and, um, I was actually expelled from high school for B, for getting pregnant because I was a wow. bad influence. Mm-hmm. Um, then I mm-hmm. waited till I turned 18, got my GED, and my husband and I went to college together. Exactly. So, exactly. That's funny. So he they... wasn't expelled, but I was. Wow. That's interesting. That's yes. interesting. <laughs> yes. That, that was rather interesting. But what are you going to do? You know. Right, those, right. <laughs> but, those, but I mean, those are some of the, these, you, you know, we, we're having a candid conversation but those are the things that people deal with. And then that's, again, how you get to see the people like me, how you end up, you know, on my couch, how you end up in in my areas because of those type of things. Somebody put in the comments, wow, um, because it's like, how do we both get this? This is something that we both created. This is, you know, to be, and I'm, you know, as a female, the only person that got, you know, expelled for that. Like, that's insane. It's the same, you know, type of things to when we we, we think about it. So, you know, we are, I am African-American. We're in Black Hi- History Month. And it's the same type of things when we talk about what happens to our, well, Black people. Um, some of the things that we get punished for, blamed for, or looked 
doll. I was watching this show the other day where it was just kind of on. And so the girl was like a reality show. And she was, I think, the only Black person. Maybe it was two people. And so a situation happened. I won't go into the details. But um, they act when she had, you know how they had the camera view where you can talk about whatever you want to. Um, like the confessional is, is what it mm -hmm. was. And so she had... Um, expressed that she was upset with the situation and so they kind of asked her why didn't she say anything and she said because I didn't want to be viewed as the angry black woman she felt that if she would have been upset or if she would have expressed her feelings mm -hmm. on the situation she would have been viewed as the angry black woman and when I tell you like I said I wasn't even watching the program it's not a show that I watch or anything like that it hurt me to my core um that even in those type of uh, environments Mm -hmm. You're on the same level as somebody else, but because you're Black, that's what's been instilled into you. You have to make sure that you are moving a certain type of way or downplaying your, you know, yourself or different things like that just because of the color of your skin. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, wow. And so I deal with those type of things, you know, every day. Again, the book is talking to parents, but I um, actually deal with kids way less than I do adults. I actually specialize in healthy relationships and parenting. And so the book was uh, kind of dedicated to that. So that we, so it doesn't really talk a lot about necessarily child behavior. Um, it does to an extent, but it's more about how do you support that child? How do you look for the right. behaviors where you know, because then I do have some clients who um, want their child, you know, it could be a five-year-old to sit down and be quiet. And it's like, but they're five years old. <laughs> they have a lot to think about. They're stimulated all the time by electronics or different things like that. They just learn new TikTok dances or they just learn. Um, my daughter, she's she's eight. She was just showing me. She was They're learning to count money. And so she had the coins. And when she picked up each one, she was able to count different things on the coins. And that told her the value of the, of the coin. And she kept doing it. And I, and I looked, but she was picking it up. And I'm like, so I'm like, wait, so I, so I had to pick it up. I'm like, well, wait, is there something on there that I didn't know that's, you know, on the coin? And um, I didn't see anything different. <laughs> and so I said, well, what are you doing? And she said, well, this is how you count it. And, and she broke it down um, to that. And so we had a whole conversation about that. But when a parent or when an adult is stressed out, when life is happening to them, um, what do you do with that? So now you're like, okay, this child is overwhelming me or this child is too much or this child is too emotional. So I kind of break down a little bit whether that's like age appropriateness or mm -hmm. if that is actually a, you know, a, a disorder that needs to be addressed because kids shouldn't be having, especially, you know, like an eight-year-old shouldn't be having a, tan a temper tantrum because they didn't get their way. They should be able to know how to express themselves appropriately. And mm -hmm. when they, when they can't, then that may be something, you know, that you come in for to see a person like me. Um, I also talk about in the book how sometimes us as parents, it's my absolutely favorite chapter, um, but how us as parents are our, or adults are the problem. We like to, I see it again all the time where they come in and they, they talk about, uh, they want me to fix their child. They want me to fix, fix their spouse. So they want me to fix their mom or, you know, whoever the person is. And it's just like, what role, role did you play into it? Like, how are you handling? And as parents, mm -hmm. as adults, we're the ones that's putting these kids in the environment. Um, so sometimes, like I talked about before, when we're talking about PTSD and different things that we experience, um, and it's not to bash parents because we do the best that we can. Sometimes we can only afford to live in those type of neighborhoods, um, and, and that's okay. But we have to learn how to teach our kids different things. Like just because you're in those environments, you don't have to be the things that's, that you see or act like the right. things that you see. So for people who just join Hey Richada, um, we're just kind of having a conversation. You guys are absolutely welcome to unmute um, and talk to us and ask questions. Um, if you have the feedback, I mean, if you have the book, you can give us feedback. Um, so yeah, just wanted to put that out there. Okay. Um, now, uh, you know, there's a lot, one of the big issues in schools today now with the parents that, that even on the Facebook group chats and everything, as bullying in the schools and um, there's the victims and then there there are the bullies. Um, we all know, you know, that, um, you know, in today's school environment, if, if a child who's being bullied, who's being picked on, who's being beaten up, 
if they even dare to strike back, they get punished at the same way as the bully is being. You know, they can't even defend themselves. And so absolutely. many children feel absolutely helpless and hopeless in these situations. And there have been multiple suicides and, and major clinical depression coming out, rising out of bullying. So I'd like to know what, as, as a professional, what is your advice to a parent whose child is being bullied? And then again, and conversely, what is, would you do if, if a parent brings a child in who is the bully? So before I answer that, because we're adults in the room, I'm, I'm going to go back to my favorite chapter in the book again and, and talk about how sometimes it can be us. And the reason why that's important to me is because I did a teen summit a couple of months ago and we were talking about healthy relationships and, um, and different things like that. And so just across the board. And as we were talking about it, um, I asked the kids, this was, I think they were ninth graders. Yeah. And so I asked the kids what... Um, so they, I asked them what wasn't healthy, um, like attribute characteristics in a relationship. And so they said toxic. So I, almost everybody at the same time said toxic. So I said, well, what does toxic mean? And so um, they described it. And I said, well, do you know toxic people in your life? That's very close to you. And one of the little girls said, my mom. And so people started laughing. And so as I looked at her, she wasn't joking. Like she was literally she met that with everything in her. And so um, I kind of asked her a little bit about it, but not too much because I did, you know, it just wasn't appropriate. And so she just kind of talked about different things that her mother does. And so she said her mom cuts people out and her mom, you know, these different type of behaviors that her mom does. And so then I, you know, kind of asked her, well, do you do those same type of things? And she was like, no, I don't want to be like my mom. And so I don't, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so, you know, that just opened the conversation, but as a parent, first off, that broke my heart. I never want to, um, my kid, that to be the reflection that, um, that my kids are seeing. So that's really important for us to make sure that when, while we're thinking that, you know, kids don't see us or they're not paying attention, paying attention mm -hmm. to us. They absolutely are. Yes. They absolutely are. My mom, um, talks about when the reason why she stopped cussing and the reason why she stopped cussing is because I was about 15 years old and I'm on the phone and I'm talking to my girlfriends and I'm just going in like yeah be this and be that and just going in and so my mom busted my room and she was like you know watch your mouth where you get that from and I said that's how you and my her you know her best friend I said that's how y'all talk and she said no and she stopped in her tracks and she said absolutely and from that moment on you will very rarely hear my mother cuss because that struck a chord to her. So that would be my first point, making sure that we're paying attention to what we're doing, what we're displaying, what we're, you know, exposing our kids to, even if it's movies, TV, you know, TV shows, all of those types of things. That's first off. Secondly, um, I experience, I see, I see this all the time when the kids come in and then they don't want to be talking um, about, it's, it's kind of embarrassing or it's kind of like you have, again, in our, in our culture, we taught to be tough and different things like that. So you will be maybe more picked on um, because you're expressing that you're being bullied. It's, it, it'll be, you'll be perceived as being, you know, weak or suck or whatever you want to call it. And then, <coughs> and so then you have to experience it in the home too, because sometimes you'll get that in a home. Um, mm -hmm. now you come home and you're like, oh, they picking on me. And then your parents or your siblings might be like, oh, you soft. Why you ain't, you know, responding this type of way. So, so that's the fear. And then, like you said, that, that lead that can lead to depression that can lead to, um, all type of different things that need to be supported and, and addressed. And then when the kid comes as the bully, it's like any other thing, people, people never, um, really think about this or talk about this and it does not give an excuse. But I truly believe, and this is not even clinical, this is just my 100% belief. I don't believe that people wake up. I mean, I know that there's chemical imbalances and blah, 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 but people don't wake up and be um, negative people. Experiences happen, things happen to them, and this is how they respond. So typically, if a person is doing something, it's because that has been done to them. If a child is bullying, typically they have been bullied in some type of capacity, um, and bullying what I mean by that, it doesn't necessarily have to mean that somebody has 
at school and bullying them. They could be abused at home. They could not have food at home. They can just, you know, just have different struggles at home and it shows up in books because they need to mask that. Um, the other thing about bullying, a lot of kids who do not know how to read, they may not be academically where they need to be and they're embarrassed by that. So they'll start doing things to bully people or, or those typically sometimes can be the class clown. So if somebody was to come, you know, bring their child to me or if they came and was like, well, this is what I'm dealing with. And we would have, you know, just different conversations to see what that looks like, where it's coming from. And that's going to be the, the most important part. Why are they doing this? They're not doing this just because they like to do it. There's something in them. There's something that's happening or that has happened that has uh, made this behavior okay is made it appropriate and again it, it's not saying that something has to necessarily happen at home they could be doing this so that they don't get bullied by others or so they can be accepted by this certain type of group of people so you will first need to understand and recognize why um you would mm -hmm. have to make sure that they're taking accountability for it because sometimes they you know they don't and then the way kids are today in this world they just kind of do it back and forth and they don't consider it bullying um and it really is we, we talk about those type of things too when I'm doing groups and different things like that because we all, you know, might make fun of each other lightheartedly, but when it begins to start hurting people's feelings, that's when it's crossed the line. And then that's when we have to do something about it. And you have to be careful about that. Another form of bullying, again, is in the families. We Some things that we think we might call each other nicknames or um, we might talk about different features that somebody has. And the person who's dealing with it or who was being talked about they may laugh and you know joke and, and sometimes it's just okay it's like whatever that's what it is but sometimes it's actually hurtful and mm -hmm. so they carry that too and then that creates that can create some you know low self-esteem or self-esteem issues and stuff like that so it can just go so across the board and I could talk about this stuff for hours um, <laughs> but yeah I um but it's, it's very important to address it's important for the the um the faculty, the educators, and everybody to make sure that when somebody is reporting these type of things that they take it serious as well, because we have seen too many kids lose their lives or attempt to lose their lives. Or the other part of that too is that's how we have these school shootings. Typically, they're coming to ret retaliate on somebody who has been bullying them or who has done something to them. They're not just shooting up the schools because they just want to. Is something that has again triggered that behavior. Mm -hmm. So when um, and most of the time it's because somebody has not listened to them, somebody has not um, tried to help them, you know, deal with this. So we have to make sure when our kids are coming to us, whether we're the parents, whether we're the edu you know, the educators, that we're taking it serious and we're not brushing it off. Right. Yes, it's uh, it, it, it's very complex. It's not just cut and dry. I don't think it's really just a bad kid who's headed for prison i mean i think you know there's a lot of steps between where uh, between a kid that's bullying in fifth grade and and you know attica you know, <laughs> Absolutely. you know or being Absolutely. ending up in prison prison it's it i think early intervention and and a team effort you know with parents being on board with the teachers to address the behaviors in the school is what's actually needed you know, um, you know, maybe timeouts away from the other kids, you know, would help them calm down a little bit. And, and, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of sensitivity training, things of that nature, so they could, you know, start to, you know, understand that, you know, that what bullying isn't cool, it's not fun, but, you know, it, it's not, you know, nobody's going to look up to you or admire you for that, you know, uh, right. it's, uh, you know, people might be afraid of you. And if that, if you're happy with that, if, of only having people uh, be nice to you because they're afraid of you, then that's not a real friendship, you know, because once the, once the, your, these, you, these kids get older, uh, they're just going to walk away from you. You're going to end up alone. So, you know, you, you, you have to, it has to be addressed, you know, in the schools and in the home at the same time, you know, it's absolutely so, you know, um, what about, you know, um, kids, you know, I know there's still, there is still a stigma, you know, to mental health issues. I know, um, you know, my own grandson just started kindergarten. He had a rough, very rough start of, of acting up in class and the, 
every day my daughter was getting contacted by the teacher and it's it's settled down now uh but you know it's it's been good for a while um and uh now it's been several weeks since there's been an issue but um you know at the beginning you know there it's you know i think we think it was all now put down to attention grabbing and it took him a while to get used to having being in a group of other children as an only child but um do you think um you know, we went, we went to, I went to the school with my daughter and we worked out a behavior modification plan where he earns points, you know, like even at home and at school. So, you know, he gets like, uh, he gets like a point every, every time he does something correctly and he behaves himself. Um, he gets, a, a like, uh, on the play recess ground, like one kid fell down and he, and, and was bleeding and he went and got the, the, the adult supervising the, you know, the aide who was supervising him. And he said, he, and he was saying, Jordan fell down and he's bleeding. He needs help. So he got, actually got a prize for doing that, mm -hmm. you know, making sure that he, that he got the kid help. So, you know, he's, you know, settling in and he's, you know, and doing much better. And um, that's, it, you know, so, which is good. And um, so it seems to have worked. So, you know, and then he gets these points and he, when he earns enough points, he gets treats, you know, he gets to like, um, he likes, like, he likes to, you know, there's this, in the East, like there's a little restaurant called Anthony's and that's actually where his father works. And he loves to go to Anthony's because his father takes him back into the kitchen and lets him look around in the kitchen. So, you know, he said, well, you know, if you can gather by Friday, if you can gather 10 together, 10 points, from between school and home, you know, you're, you will take you to dinner at Anthony's, you know, on Friday or Saturday. And that's, you know, so that's sorry, <laughs> but that's, that's a great point because a lot of times we think about consequences. So I, I learned, um, and my, my daughter, my oldest daughter just joined, Hey, Maria. Um, but I learned kind of having two sets of kids, um, from my son, my son is the type of person that you can take things away from him and it doesn't, it didn't right. matter to him. He's the exactly. type of person that needed to earn stuff, just like your grandson. Um, my daughter, you take stuff away, take the phone away from her and stuff like that. Like she responded to that way, you know, differently than my son. So that's the one thing that's important, like you said, to make sure that it's not all about consequences. It's not all about punishment um, because you can't always need to uh and, and Rashad in the comments said her her daughter needed uh rewards too because you can't always pun punishment is not always the best thing for people like right. that's not that shouldn't be our go-to thing all the time yes there's consequences but sometimes the consequences is that you don't get to go to daddy's job like you said and right. that's important to to the kids that's that's very very important and when, when we're just talking about men, mental health stigma, a lot of times people think that they only need to see a therapist when it's the worst of the worst. They right. think that they only can see the, the therapist when, you know, um, life is almost over for them or they feel like it's almost over for them. But the fact that a matter is the things that you're saying, those are coping skills that you can come and see a therapist with and um, I'm, see a therapist for. And, and those are the types of things that we'll talk about it's not all about what you see on tv tv where we're asking you how you feel and all of this type of stuff we will ask that that's important things too but we act, especially if you come to me i am a very practical person um i am a very a very physical person so i like people i like to do things in person um my love language is quality time and so i like to be around people and i like to do things and those things are important to me and it becomes important to my clients too because we're going to i'm not going to just yes i'm going to listen to you and i'm going to try to figure out what works best for you but then i'm going to give you some practical tips and it's going to be tailored to what that situation is what your personality what your love language is and those type of things mm -hmm. so i really really love that you guys are incorporating that and you get to do it in a way that like basically give us a testimonial to say that these things does work like you don't mm -hmm. always have to whoop your kids you don't always have to punish your kids or you don't you know have to do things that can potentially create other problems right um and again i had to like i said my oldest daughter is on here so she can really attest to this but i had to learn those type of things that those you don't have to always be aggressive or you know, um, there, there's other ways that you can support your kids, still discipline them, still hold them accountable and create consequences, but it just doesn't have to look like punishment all the time. Right. 
Yeah, because it's we we found out it was because he was being punished. I mean, she would she would have put a gate up into his toy room because he has his own toy room and say, OK, you you cannot go in your toy room. You're not getting access to any of your toys. And he didn't care. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fine. I was when I was younger, we had to, you know, eat everything off our plate, basically. And um, I would you couldn't get up or you couldn't go outside and play, you know, oh. or you couldn't go play, watch TV until you finish eating your food. And if I didn't want it, I wasn't going to eat it. So I would literally sit there all day. I would play. I suck my thumb at the time. I would play, you know, with my fingers. I would play with, you know, anything on the table. I did not care if I did not want that food. I was not. I would try to hide the food, throw it in the garbage, you know, all of those type of things. But I would, if I had to sit there, <laughs> I would sit there and then finally they would get. And that's the other thing, too, as parents. Sometimes our kids, they have a lot more patience than us. They, they're a lot more um, strategic than us. And so they can sometimes wait us out. And now we're frustrated and we're upset. And then that leads to them, us punishing them more than we actually need to because we're not compromising or we're not looking for other ways. Um, oh, so then you. everybody will be outside playing and I'll just be sitting there singing to myself, humming, you know, doing whatever. And then they'll finally look like, go to bed or go, you know, they'll give in almost every time before I do. So that's important to know too, like know your child and know what makes sense. I have clients who are like, well, I whoop my kids all the time. And Ohio is a physical discipline state. So if that's what you do, that's what you do, you know, appropriately. But I always challenge my clients when they say, well, I whooped them and nothing is working. And I'm like, well, why are you keep whooping them then? Like, why would you keep doing the same things over and over and over again? And it's not working. That does not make sense. So don't whoop them again. How about you do this? So, um, yeah, parenting is a lot. It's challenging. Um, so go. <laughs> Felicia said it's important for adults to learn what works for them too. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, guys, y'all can take yourself off mute and talk to us. I, I appreciate y'all for joining me. This is this is all my tribe here. So um, I definitely appreciate y'all taking out time to, to join me. Um, but yeah, that's, that's important too. That's very important to know. And to know your triggers too. Like as an adult, we need to know our triggers. We need to know what the, I, you know, I have some parents who will not punish their kids or they will not, um, you know, whoop their kids or they won't take anything away from them because from their experience, they experience that so extreme in their eyes that they don't want to do that. And, and that's right. not good either because they're, they do need to be held accountable. They do need to have consequences. It just needs to be appropriate to the what happened and, um, and to the age as well. I know. Yeah, because I was never one for making kids finish all their plate because my mother did that to me as well. And I remember I would just sit there and I would just look and I would like take a piece of meat and, and the cat would always be underneath the table by me. And I would just like you know, <laughs> feed, feeding the cat. <laughs> so, yeah. And then eventually my father would take pity on me because my father knew and he just he, he didn't want to challenge my mother because my mother could be. Ooh, yeah. yeah. So he, what he would do is he would like reach over and scrape some of my food onto his plate and eat it. You know? My grandfather would do that for me too. So. Yeah, so, he wouldn't have to, so I wouldn't have to eat it. And then, you know, later on, like, you know, number one, my mother was a terrible cook. Okay. <laughs> she was horrible. She, it was the, seriously, she made a couple of things well, but for the day to day, no, you wouldn't want to eat that food. And <laughs> My and kids would probably say the same thing about me. <laughs> <laughs> so my father would would eat it up because he, you know, he said, he would just say, to me, "I was in the army, I can eat anything." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then it's like after dinner, he'd know I was hungry, and he'd say, "Hey, Barney," because that was my mom's family nickname was Barney. And um, um, you know, I need to go to the lumber shop to get some uh, some special nails for that. Uh, the project I want to do. Um, I want to take Dawn to the lump and he'd take me to a hamburger joint and get me a burger. Oh, oh wow. Wow. <laughs> so I wouldn't be hungry. And then we would go buy nails and bring it home. And so, and so we could show, yes, yeah, 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 I went to the lumber shop, you know. <laughs> and, and, and that's important too, because like, so for, for my daughter too, um, you, you hear, so I'll talk about you. But she, one of the things that we did, um, one of our biggest challenges was dress, like how to dress. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I wanted this one style. I wanted my little pretty little girl to be this, you know, this type of way. And then she wanted to wear what was cool and what, you know, what she was comfortable in. And um, 
I was like, we, that was like one, I don't even know if she remembered this, but that was like one of our battles and our, and her godmother was like, listen, if it's not inappropriate, mm -hmm. you know, let her do it. Like what, what harm is it in there? And so from that moment on, I started letting her, um, cause I would go shopping for her, you know, whether she was with me or not and just things like that. And so we had to switch off to that and know that you're, I mean, you know, in her eyes, I'm an old lady, like you're an old lady, your style does not work. It doesn't look mm -hmm. good or, you know, whatever the case, this is what the kids is wearing. And I'm like, no, you need to be an individual and this looks cute on you. And you know, this type of things. And so those things are important too, to not try to be the, I, I had um, somebody call me today about their kid and it's like, listen, some things that when they say pick your battles, some things you need to just pick your battles off. If right. it's if it's clean and it's appropriate and they don't have a school uniform or whatever, let them do it. Uh, I think the schools are even doing that. They're relaxing their dress code a whole lot more. They were really strict on, you know, like hoodies and bandanas and different things like that and just certain stuff. And now they just yeah. like, if it's not hurting anybody, if it's not, exactly. you know, uh disrespectful allow them to do it and as parents we have to do those type of things sometimes too because what we see of course we're not talking about things that's that's not safe or appropriate mm -hmm. but what we think is um <laughs> my daughter put 100 <laughs> uh, <laughs> what we think is is cool or okay is it doesn't look the same to them we know each generation it looks different. It changes up from time right. to time. So you have to be mindful of those type of things and not just try to be like, well, it's my money I'm paying for it type of thing. And it's like, yeah, this is my money and I'm paying for it, but this is what you're going to get for this amount of money. And I'll mm -hmm. tell parents those type of things too. Like, listen, if you're spending a hundred dollars and they want to get one shirt, then they just better wear that shirt every single day. Um, and then those right. are the consequences that come with it. And and that's important versus the trying to win. We we get to the point we get as parents, we stay in too many power struggles. Right. Now there is a point where you have to be respectful, and you're and there are rules you're going to have to follow if you live in my house. Like that's just across the board. But all of those rules does shouldn't always apply to every kid. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned that the hard way. I learned that you yeah. know through parenting. And then the other thing is too, is like, is it really that important? Like, is it even going to matter tomorrow? Is it even going to matter right. in a month? Like, would you, do you want to spend so much time stressed up, stressed out, bound up, um, not having a relationship or not, or your child not happy versus whatever, go cut your hair, color your hair, do whatever you want to do. Um, again, with, if it's appropriate, um, it was a comment that just popped up. Y'all yeah, just ain't gonna talk to talk to us, huh? Y'all just gonna have me <laughs> and Miss Don doing all the talking. Uh, Ebony yeah. Adams said, "Most definitely, most times it's hard enough for them to focus. So the last thing we want to do is add more stress to them about clothing. Get great conversation and definitely needed. Thank you. Um, yeah, and that's that's true too because some they already like we talked about bullying. They always already maybe getting picked on or um, if you can't afford the latest fashion, that's already something." The anxiety, the pressure that these kids have today is not like we had. Um, right. So we want to make sure that we're not cre creating those type of things. My daughter and I, my, my youngest daughter and I, we're very good at doing affirmations in the morning. And what I learned to do too um, is to not, there's certain conversations or certain things that we don't talk about in the morning anymore because it just don't start our day right. off. Right. It throws our day completely off. Now, there is, then you, you expect them to have this great day or you expect them to perform appropriately. And they can't because y'all, you didn't, you know, cuss them out and not necessarily use cuss words, but put them in a mood. So we have to be careful mm -hmm. about those type of things too, because that's, that's how we create um, those different patterns or negative feelings for Definitely. our kids. Uh, so I know. I, I I mean, I remember I did a lot of, I screwed up a lot of things as a parent. I can think of instances and instances where I'm thinking like, I shouldn't have done that. I oh, I shouldn't have said that. And, and things like that. Like I remember once my, my daughter loved her long hair. And when she was in sixth grade, she was flipping her hair on the school bus and, and she got kicked off the school bus for it because the kids behind her would complain. So me, and I wish I hadn't done it. I that night she came from school. I took her to a to a beauty salon, and I had her hair all cut off. Wow! Mm -hmm. And she cried and cried. And after I did it, I'm thinking, 
I am such a bad mother. You know, I, there was other things I could have done. You know, I could have, I could have like done a better job of fixing her hair up and pinning it back or braiding it in the back so that she wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be able to do that on the bus. And, and, and I, and to this day, to this day, my daughter's 37. She was 10. I still feel so guilty about what I did that, that, that day. And well, Ms. Dow, I want to, I want to make sure that you are um, extending yourself grace on that. Uh, Ebony Adams put a very good thing in the, in the comments that speaks to that. And she actually put this before you said it. So that's, that's interesting. Um, but it, she said, parenting doesn't come with the handbook. It's, is much needed and can definitely apply to our relationships with our children. Um, again, my daughter being on here, I've had to apologize to her several times. I remember one time she was in school singing and she just kept singing. And so I was just like, well, you like to sing so much. So, or I think maybe she was dancing. So I made, I was like, dance now. And I just made her just keep dancing and keep dancing and keep dancing. It is funny now, but it wasn't funny and it wasn't, um, it just wasn't appropriate to, to, to parent that way. So I want you to, you know, at some point be able to just look into yourself and know that you, you did the best that you could. You thought that you were solving a, a solution. You didn't know how it was going to affect. And we, you, sometimes you have split, the, split seconds. You, we make a split decision um, and it's okay. Your daughter knows you love her because you still, you still can feel it, you know, years later, there are millions of things to that I have you know done and that I will continue to do I still have two more kids that's not you know adults that I will continue to do um but we have we just do our best we look for support we go by Ebony J's book um and use those tips and tools and we just continue to improve ourselves or you know on ourselves and make sure that we're checking in on what we have going on that you know, we that's another good point too about like not disciplining kids when you're angry in the moment of that, right. um, and or not taking things out on our kids because we can have a rough day and you come home. And I know for me, one of one of my things was if I came home and that house was a mess, I would lose it. Um, especially because I like I typically like to clean or I'm typically the cleaner, and I just want you to maintain it. So I come home and it's like you've been home all day and you cleaning whatever. So that was something for me. So now a tip that I give parents and that I actually use myself is sometimes I will sit in my car for a few minutes and I will talk to myself and I will be like, listen, you've had a rough day. You know, when you walk in this house, there's a good chance homework not done. You know, the laundry isn't done. The dishes is like, you already know that this is a possibility. So you have the choice. You can go in there, snap, flip out, still ain't gonna change it, it's not done. And then you're gonna feel worse or you can sit here for a few minutes, drink, your listen to music. Drink coffee but yeah listen to to music you know do whatever you're gonna do sit here calm yourself down walk into the house and then you can calmly have a conversation or just go upstairs and wait till tomorrow because of where you are so going back to that comment that Felicia said you have to know yourself you always have to be checking yourself and seeing what you do and these are little people who one of the things I hate when people say and I used to say it all the time too but I, I don't um is when we ask them why did they do something? And they say, I don't know. And it's like, no, you do know. You have to know. You have. And we think about it, um, the, 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 the human brain is not developed to like 25. So sometimes they just do stupid stuff because there are kids that do stupid stuff that's, a, that's supposed to do stupid stuff. That's how you learn. And we're like, no, 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 you have to. No, I don't. I don't know. I just did it because it just popped into my head. I don't have impulse control yet, or I don't, you know, I'm not able to control my emotions yet, um, or I haven't been taught how to do that or whatever the case. So I just did it. And I just- I'm still working on whatever. that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, me too. Like, and that's just, you know, so it's important to know those types of things, to know our kids, to know us, to know where, you know, where we come from and to continue to learn. Again, these kids, they, they deal with things that we didn't have to do. Um, or didn't have to deal with, I'm sorry. Uh, they So they, they deal with a lot of different things we did. So we don't always understand it, but we have to take the time to sit down and really understand it, really listen to them. Sometimes it's still not gonna make sense, but, and that's okay. <laughs> but um, we, we have to take inventory of ourselves and those type of things and just support each other. Having these conversations again, I truly appreciate it. So I'll tell y'all really quickly, I, I walked into the library. I actually went to the library. I was like, how do I get my book in here? And 
and the person was like, oh, I'll just give it to somebody. Um, she's not here, I'll give it to her. And so I'm just like, okay. I'm like, well, how would I know if you guys are going to, you know, get my book? That's like, just kind of brushed me off. So I went back a couple of weeks ago and Ms. Bond was there and she, you know, looked up the description and all of that stuff. And she immediately um, was, uh, bought the book right then and there and everything like that and got it into the library. And then we had a conversation, she read it. We had a conversation and so she, actually booked this for me months ago and I truly truly appreciate it because these are the type of things that we don't get to talk about like when she shared a story about her daughter like a lot of times we you don't want to share that you have been a bad parent or that you did something wrong or something like that but the fact of the matter is we all have and we all will period so having these type of conversations um are something that I love to do so when she asked me I absolutely um was like, yes, and I 100% appreciate you guys for coming in and just taking the time and, you know, come and talk, well, y'all chat with us in the box, but <laughs> I still well, appreciate that. Can I, I ask a question? People. We'd love you to ask a question. Okay, so I don't have kids, but I'm an auntie. Um, my niece is older, and so she started to text me more, um, but I had to put like a disclaimer out there to say, hey, you know, I'm here for you, but there are some things that you, if you share with me, I have to tell your mom. Well, then she kind of stopped sharing. Um, and her mom was kind of like, well, yeah, thank you. But I have another friend where she's in the same situation and her sister said, no, I want to create a safe space for her and I trust you. And so if that space is you, I just trust that you're going to be that support for her. So this is kind of for parents. Um, how do they navigate that? Because on one hand, it's like you want to be in the know. Uh, but on the other hand, if your child has a safe space and it's someone that you trust, do you just let that be? So I think that is thank you so much for that um i think that that's that's a, a kind of tricky one it kind of depends so my my aunt is actually on here and um my mom allowed her to be one of my safe spaces um because my mom trusted her that she, that she would do the right you know the right things but what happens when it's a situation that an aunt can't do something so what happens if if the if you know, somebody gets pregnant or it gets something that you involved with. So it's, it's, it's a tricky thing. I think that it depends on what it is. Um, it's important that if you do have a youth, a child that's coming to you and they are confiding in you, that you do build that trust. Um, but I think that you did the right thing to say that, yeah, there, there are some things that I need to tell your parents about. I have to, as a professional, when, when my clients come in, I have, I do an assessment and I talk to, you know, the, the child and the parents together. Then I talk to the child individually and I talk to the parents together. But the one thing that I tell them, there are some things that I have to report and there are some things that I have to tell your parents about. Um, but depending on the age group, so once they get in like high school and stuff like that, a lot of times what I try to do first is try to coach them into talking to the parent. Um, so I try to tell that, let's just say if, a, if, if somebody was pregnant. So before I go tell them, I'm going to have a session with them and we're going to talk about it. And it's like, you have to talk to your parent and we'll, and I'll walk them through the, you know, what kind of practice things to say and how to approach the situation or if we need to bring them in the office if they feel like it's not safe or you know different things like that and then if at some point the child then I, I'm going to follow up with the parent too and then at some point if the child never does it I'm going to give them a little bit of time you know what's appropriate but if they don't do it then I will have to have that conversation so just making sure that you're honest that, that the child never feels like you are betraying them because even if they even if you tell and they feel some type of way because you're doing it um, to protect them and for the better good, eventually they'll get over it and they'll understand and they'll recognize why you did that. I have I have never had an experience where somebody told something for the right reasons, you know, to keep them safe and, and the child didn't later appreciate that. Now, how later that, you know, depends on the child. <laughs> they might not forgive you for a little while, but overall when they when they are at the when they're able to actually understand and realize then, then they'll be okay 
You know, I, um, I'm a former teacher. And at one point, I had a student. I'm going to call her Gina, okay? Gina was just a freshman in high school. And um, she confided, not to me, but to one of her other teachers, her actual homeroom teacher, because I was just her English teacher. She confided that her older brother had been sexually abusing her at home for the past two years. And um, actually, he did end up going to prison for sexual abuse of a non-related minor, you know, about, uh, you know, a couple years after this. So, of course, you know, as teachers in the school, we act in local and parentis. Uh, so we actually did have to report this to Child and Family Services. And they went in and uh, confronted, you know, told the parents and, and all this other stuff. And it became a huge thing. And... Um, the parents took up for their son. They uh, they started saying, "Oh, Gina is mentally ill. Gina is uh, making things up, and 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 all this other stuff." And and Gina ended up being the one who was actually taken out of the home and put into a mental health facility um, until she recanted. And they wow. made it clear. Wow. They went and the parents went and said. You recant, you say you were making it all up just to get even with your brother for taking money out of your drawer and um, you can come home. Wow. So to get, just to get out of there, cause the place was, she says they were just actually, she told me this, she told me this after she graduated cause we, mm -hmm. we're actually Facebook friends now. Mm -hmm. And um, she's telling me just to get out of there, Miss Dawn, we, I had to recant just to get out of there because that place was worse than my house. Because right. mm -hmm. I was being abused there too, you know. There were male guards. They were they, they were bothering me and 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 everything. She says, and it it was. She says, at least at my home, I only had one person doing this to me. Right. Wow. You know. And um, but she ended up. She ended up being expelled from school because of behavioral problems. She uh, she one day she picked up and threw a a, a desk out the window. <laughs> so, you know, her her desk, and uh, that's what she got expelled for. And and. And, and but it was she had a very very rough life I mean and I always liked her because you know she was actually a pretty bright kid you know and um, when I had her in my class and she did seem to be good in my class she but I, I didn't you know I was surprised when I found out what she did that got her expelled but you know and I feel terrible I just feel like the school failed her we failed her as teachers we the school failed her her parents failed her and it's just a testament today. She's happily married. She has two kids of her own. They seem, she seems to be doing well in life, but still she had to go through this. Yeah. You know? And the thing is like, when you're talking about her, her throwing that, that, uh, that through the window is because she felt pain. She felt unprotected. She felt, you know, all of these type of things. And as a child, if your parents don't protect you, right. How heartbreaking is that? All right. And she confided and she thought that the school betrayed her by turning this, this thing in. But what else could we do? Right, right. It has to be reported. You know, I mean, the school teachers can lose their license for not reporting, yeah. you know. And it's just it, it was just there. it's one of those damned if you do and damned if you don't and situations. And you just, you know, it, it was just one of the saddest things. She I mean, she. She got from here to there, but she went this way to do it. You know what I'm saying? And um, it took her longer, you know, much a lot longer time to to get from here to there. So, you know, she's, well, she's, oh, gosh, she's in her 40s by now. But, you know, so, you know, so she made it, but it was a long, hard roll for her. And she, she, you know, you could still tell she's in a lot of pain from what she went through, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, these kind of, things that happen in the home it's like I, she's just one of my students that I never forgot you know, yeah, you know you, I'll, I'll always you remember her name I'll always remember the incidents uh, and everything and and it's just something that you know I, I you just you know you take the it's hard as a teacher not to become emotionally involved with your children with your students you know uh, to, to maintain it's the same as a, it's the same as a therapist it's it's hard to not, you know, make connections and and um and want to take people home and want to, you know, yeah. make sure one that of the reasons okay. I quit being a teacher. 
Yeah. That's what it's one of the reasons. It's very left, hard. You know, I, I became a librarian because it's like, number one, I don't act in local parentis. I'm not giving them grades. I have no power over them. So, you know, I can just, you know, talk about books and things that happen in books and maybe, you know, say, well, I know I read this book that this had sort of happened to the character and here's what happened in the book and what they did, you know. <laughs> Ms. Yeah. Don said, I, I ain't about to be no teacher. I'm going to go talk to these people about these books. <laughs> yeah. That's that's the best you can I can do. And, you know, and I'm like, you know, and I don't, you know, have to, you know, deal with the 30 of them at a time, you know. <laughs> right, right. So well, you guys still have me. I'm still, I'm still in in the trenches with people. I'm still willing to to do those things for a little while longer, just a little while longer. Um, <laughs> Why don't you give a plug to your give a plug to your company now? So um, again, it's called Endurance Force Inc. It is a nonprofit that provides clinical therapeutic services across the board. Um, we have I have I think a total of like five therapists now. Um, I have some coaches. I have some. Um, some programs that we're going to be rolling out. We're right in Euclid, Ohio, um, in the old Omni building. I forgot what it, the National Strategy Building now, I think is what it's called. Um, and we provide services from five up until whatever age. So it's not just a lot of people think that I'm a child therapist and I actually see way less clients than people think, but we do take. Um, children if that's something that you need and again if you just need to talk about parenting your child because it's stressing you out that's something that we can help you with um and then of course we want I want you to go you can get the book from you can um uh, rent it from the Euclid library or you can go on Amazon and purchase it um and it's you also called Enduring the Course and what about Medicaid Yes, I, I accept Medicaid. Thank you. <laughs> I accept Medicaid and I accept private insurances too. And I also take cash clients. Some people don't want to use their insurances. So we have you covered across the board, whatever your financial situation is. Um, we, we also have um, like scholarships and different things. If you're insured, sometimes the co-pays are very, very high. Um, so we, if you need those type of things, or if you know, everybody on here know me, but if somebody wants to record is if you need, um, you can reach out to us. The website is www.enduringthecourseinc. Um, or you can reach out to Ms. Don, cause I know that's a, a lot. Um, and yeah, get the I can, information. I can, I can always, I'll, I have the information. They can always come to the library and get it. Yes. And, um, I know somebody from your office is also doing uh, and uh, another Zoom uh, program later this year with Carla about um, Amazon. Doing publishing. it next month. Yep, yeah. next month we're we're okay. uh, we'll be. I'll be back with um, my um, one of my team members to talk okay. about self publishing books and stuff like that. Yeah. We love Euclid Library. Hopefully, you guys <laughs> will join us again if you think yeah, about. And I publishing hope you will join us again too. It's been real. Oh, this absolutely. Been, I've, I've I've learned a lot. I've I, I've uh, you know to help with my daughter and my grandson and, you know, cause I'm, they live around the corner from me. So I'm very involved in their lives. <laughs> so, good, good, good. So. We need that. We need those type of things. We need grandparents to still be involved. We need grandparents, you know, wisdom and love and support. And Ms. Dodd was telling me how she gets her grandson and he gets to eat dessert before dinner. So <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty cool. Um, yes. We get to yeah. break it. That's, that's the rule I allow him to break. You know, his parents have a rule. And I said, we're going to, I said, you know what? When you're with me, we're going to break your parents' rule. You get to have dessert first. <laughs> so we've been doing, I, I've been doing this now since he was three years old. And it's like. That's so awesome. I love I it. I go to like Baker it. Square and, and it's like, and the waitresses just know us now. And they're like, I know. What kind of pie do you want today, Les William? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so cool. She knew, she already knew, huh? <laughs> yeah. And it's like. I'll do the lemon meringue today. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So thank you guys for joining us. Um, and I will talk to you guys soon. Right, thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you for uh, logging in. Bye.